right, welcome everybody to our first English interview for Indeflatie.nl. It's a Dutch website, uh, but money is a global phenomenon, and especially in these times when the markets are very intertwined internationally. Our next guest is Professor Steve Henke, uh, a professor of applied economics at the Johns Hopkins University in the United States, and he is an authority on monetary uh, on the monetary system and all things related to money. So uh, welcome, Doctor of uh, Professor Henke, for uh, making the time to uh, educate us about money. Well, it's great to be with you, Tom Thomas. Thanks for having me. No problem. I'm very pleased that you uh, found the time to uh, talk to me. Uh, before we go into the um, into the matters of money, could you please give our give our audience uh, a small uh, short introduction about uh, your background and your work on uh, the monetary phenomena? Because I am I am very aware of all your work, but I don't think that uh, a lot of the Dutch audience is. So, if you could please do a short introduction about your work, that will be very great. Okay. Uh well, I, as you indicated, I am a professor at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, United States. Uh, I, I'm in my 54th year as a professor at Johns Hopkins, which which makes me the, the most senior professor on the faculty, I think. <laughs> but uh, I've, I've spent uh, quite a few years focusing on monetary matters and and roughly the starting point for that uh was around 1980 when i served as a member of president reagan's council of economic advisors so m moving beyond that um i in the 1990s was involved with designing and implementing a number of big currency reforms uh in argentina in 1991, Estonia in 1992, Lithuania in 1994, Bulgaria in 1997, Bosnia 1997, Montenegro 1999, and Ecuador in 2001. And uh, those, those reforms were either the introduction of something we call currency board systems, where the, a local currency, for example, in Estonia, was Estonia in 1992 uh, was using the the old Soviet ruble. They didn't even have their own money. <laughs> They'd just become independent. Uh, I wrote a book, uh, actually two books, on a currency board for Estonia. And what that would do is the following. The Estonians would issue their own money for the first time uh, for <laughs> since, uh, since the fall of, of communism. And, and that currency would trade at a fixed exchange rate with, with an anchor currency. And it would be backed 100% with the anchor currency. So it would really be a clone of the anchor currency. And that's that's what they did. And that's what we did in Lithuania. That's what we did in Bulgaria and Bosnia. In Montenegro and Estonia, we did something similar, but, but, uh, but a little bit different. And that is, we just replaced the local money they were using with some foreign currency. In the case of Montenegro in 1999, we replaced the hyperinflating Yugoslav dinar with the German mark. And in Ecuador in 2001, we, we replaced the collapsing Sucre with the U.S. dollar. So, so those are big currency reforms. It took more or less, as you can see, uh, a, the decade of the 90s. That's what I was engaged in. Now, more generally, monetary policy, which we're going to be talking about today, uh, and the operation in particular of the Federal Reserve System in the United States and, and the U.S. economy, that, that work uh, really 
really started in kind of the mid 1980s, a, a lot of work in that area, because at that time I became the chief economist at the Friedberg Mercantile Group in Toronto, Canada, and ultimately became the chairman of the group and, and, and chairman emeritus of that group right now, which, which is, a, it's a trading house. We're trading precious metals, commodities, equities, bonds, you know, anything that trades, we're trading it. And uh, the kind of the capstone for that is that as part of that operation, I was a president of Toronto Trust Argentina in Buenos Aires. And in 1995, that, that was the world's best performing fund. Uh, we, we were uh, up 79 and a quarter percent in 1995. So we were the, the top f performer in the world. So all, that's, all pretty, of that's, pre that, that's pretty great. <laughs> well, uh, the, the, the trading activity in general, you, you have to pay attention to money. <laughs> So, so now we're getting into the topic. So that's a little background. So you have all these currency reforms, that's, that's related to money, and, and you have trading activity, which is all related to money. So what I'm going to be talking about is, I'll, I'll be talking about it, obviously, as a, as a professor, but also as someone, I've actually done it. We're, we're not in a classroom now talking about economic theory. I'm talking about things I actually have done. And 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 so it's it's more, shall we say, real world. There's there's no one better for the position of applied economics than you, Professor. Well, let's hope so. Well, let's see how it goes. <laughs> I, so okay. if we start with money, let, yes. let's, let's, we have uh, people think money, you know, is is what you have in your wallet, uh, uh, note uh, notes, coins, that kind of thing. That's true. But if you look at money as measured uh, broadly in the United States by the Federal Reserve, the M2 is the designation for the money supply that's the most broadly measured. And, and that ha does contain currency, notes and coins, but that's only about 11% of the total money supply. So what else is in it? Well, demand deposits, your checking accounts, that's money. That, that counts, that, that's about 24%. Then you have other liquid deposits that are, you know, short-term savings accounts, certificates of deposits, all, all this sort of thing. That, that's another 54% roughly of the money supply. And, and then we get down into small denomination time deposits. And, and that's about 4%. And then retail money market funds uh, in the United States, about 7.5%. So if you add all those things up, those are the components. Currency, demand deposits, other liquid deposits, small denomination time deposits, and money market funds. So that's, that's what comprises M2, which we'll be talking about. That's the broad measure that's used in the United States. Uh, and... When we define it, the importance of it, it, it it's, it's quite simple. M money, those things added together, that's the fuel for the economy. That's what makes the economy go. It's like fuel in your car. If you don't have any fuel in the car, you, you can't move. Or, or now, I, I know we're talking in Holland, and of course, every time I get picked up in Amsterdam, everybody's driving a, a, a Tesla. With it. So yes. If, you're, if your battery is not charged, you do not move. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, the M2 is the uh, fuel or electricity of the of the car. That's that's correct. So, so how do we analyze this? The fuel and how, how the fuel makes the engine go, and and the way we do that is something called the quantity theory of money. And, and the quantity theory of money is, in fact, the most reliable model for what we call national income determination. That, that's the, the course that the economy is going to go on is we can analyze with the quantity theory of money, and that will uh, give us a good reading on 
where inflation is going and where real economic activity is going. And, and if we look at the history of the quantity theory of money, it goes way back to the 16th century. Uh, and, and the scholastics in Spain uh, were, were are arguably one of the original groups of people that were developing the quantity theory of money. And then in France, you had Jean Baudin, who is the major personality, actually, behind the quantity theory of money. And then you go down and you have David Hume, who wrote the, his discourses. That, that was in the 16th century. And, and he has a chapter called On Money. And, and that's all quantity theory of money. Hmm. And, and then you have all the classical economists, all, all the way really from uh, Adam Smith to Karl Marx. The whole, the whole gamut of the classicals, were they were all using the quantity theory of money. Oh, wow. And, and more recently, of course, we, we had in the United States, one of the most famous uh, personalities was Irving Fisher, a uh, famous professor at Yale University. And, and then... Uh, of course, most recently, you, we have Milton Friedman, Nobel laureate, who's the, yes. the, the dean of the quantity theory of money, and 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 some practitioners like myself and and John Greenwood, uh, who I work with. Uh, John was formerly, until he retired uh, about a year ago, uh, the chief economist at Invesco, the, the big investment fund. Oh. Yeah. And, and now he's a fellow at the Johns Hopkins University, and we, we work together uh, on many things, but focusing largely on the quantity theory of money and how it applies in the economy. So, And, and I might add that, that a, there was a question in the New York Times yesterday, and the question was, why didn't anyone get the inflation story right in the United States? And and they didn't get it right. My, my answer is, forget the New York Times answer, my answer is because most economists were not using the quantity theory of money. John Greenwood and I were using the quantity theory of money, and when we saw the explosion in the money supply in 2020, 2021, we... we applied the quantity theory of money, and we predicted that inflation might go up as high as 9%. Well, it actually peaked out in, in July of yes. 2021 at 9.1%. So we, we, we hit the bullseye. And, and then we, we saw that they after March of 2022, the money supply started contracting very rapidly in the United States, and, and we predicted that inflation was going to come down very rapidly. And, and by the end of this year, we, we predicted the inflation would would be between 2 and 5%. Now it's running at 3.7% in the United States. So we, we hit the bullseye there. And where do we think it's going next year using the quantity theory of money? We'll get into this a little bit later. But and I'll repeat it. But we think the inflation rate will probably be down at one to two percent next year by the end of next year, 2024, in the United States. So, so th this gets. Let's let's talk about how the how this quantity theory of money actually works, and and what the in in fact the transmission mechanism is. The transmission mechanism is, is very important to, to get a handle on because the first thing that happens is we, we have a sustained change in the money supply. It, it either goes up a lot or it goes down a lot. So we have a sustained change. And, and then the next thing that happens is that asset prices change. But it takes one to three months after the change in the money supply before we get these changes in asset prices. So the stock market goes up, real estate prices go up, and all, is these, it for... all these asset prices go up next. And, 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 and then the next thing that happens, 
after about six to 18 months after the sustained change in the money supply, economic activity starts changing. So with the big increase in the money supply, well, economic activity picked up about 18, a year and a half after, you see, after the money supply change. And then ultimately inflation changes with a lag of about 12 to 24 months after the money supply changes. So you get these, the, the, the transmission thing, money supply change, asset price changes, real economic activity changes, and then the last thing that changes in it is inflation. So you get a long lag as, as, as the fuel goes into the system and starts making the, the wheels turn faster or, or turns more slowly. And, and to get some handle on this, I, I just published uh, about three weeks ago in the journal World Economics an article in which I looked at 147 countries from 1990 to 2021, and I and I just looked at the change in the money supply and the change in inflation in 147 countries, and and Milton Friedman made it made a statement once. Friedman said that there'd be a one-to-one -one relationship between changes in the money supply and changes <laughs> in inflation. Well, it turned out at, with this empirical test, he was pretty close because I, I have a correlation between changes in the money supply in those 147 countries and changes in their inflation of 0 0.96. It's, it's almost one. It's almost, almost one to one, yeah. So, so this, this, is, this is why you want to focus on money changed money and ultimately you're going to get changes in inflation so what happened in in the united states when when we cha when we had this big increase in the money supply if we look at uh, changes in m2 between march 2020 thomas and march 2022 the the average change, the, the change per annum, the average annual change was 17.4 percent. Now that's that's a huge change. That's that we it's never grown that fast in the United States since since World War II. And what is then, an, uh, what what is an average rate of growth from uh, when when looking back from the Second World War or maybe? An, another time frame uh, that know you know? The, off the top of my head, I don't know what the average is. Uh, but looking at, let's say, 2008, and that was when the Great Recession started in the United States, and Le Lehman collapsed and, and went bankrupt, as you'll remember. From mm -hmm. 2008 um, until 2020, the Average rate of growth in the money supply was it was around five, five and a half percent, something like that. So seventeen point four percent is very fast. Now, I'll yeah. I'll talk about this in a minute. But the Hankey's golden growth rate for the money supply M two that would be consistent with hitting an inflation target of two percent is six point three percent. If if you want if you want to hit two percent. You, you have to have the money supply growing at roughly about 6%. So as you can see, it was growing about three times faster than the golden growth rate. So so it was a, a growing very, very fast. So according to and, the quantity theory of money, the inflation was at that point already baked into the cake? It was baked into the cake, exactly. Because once once the money supply starts growing between March 2020 and March 2022 at 17.4%, we know that with a lag in that transmission mechanism that I just went over, we will eventually get inflation and, and higher inflation. And, and that's what we got. I mean, we, it peaked out at 9.1% per year, uh, which is obviously about a little over four times higher than the inflation target of 2%. Yeah. Yes. 
so so it's it, it's all about money and the and the in the fuel that you have so 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 we we what what did we have next we had we had the money supply going up but the asset prices remember were the second thing that click in in the transmission mechanism and between march 2023 uh, uh, march of 2020 and january of 2022 we had the s&p 500 the stock market went up 114% and home prices went up 43% and then the next thing in the transmission mechanism is real economic activity kicks in and between 2021 and 2022 the year over year change in the real gdp was 4.1% and the potential growth rate in the economy is is about 2.3% in the united states mm -hmm. so the economy got very hot it, it, got, yeah. it really went up and the average change in the consumer price index 2021 to 2022 was 6.4%. So it's over three times higher than the target. So it, so it all works. Change in the money supply, you get the transmission thing going, asset prices change, real economic activity change, and inflation changes with a with a lag, of course. Yes. So, so the, the 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 trick is, if you're looking at current data, you're 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 looking at the effects of the, the causal factor making those effects change, and the causal factor is the money supply. And, but that happened a long time ago. Long time ago. So basically, and, and you're no, looking. No, no one's looking at that. Now, and that's what you, you said, Thomas. You said once you see the change in the money supply, it's baked in the cake. All, all the rest of it's baked in the cake. So it's kind of like um, like they are looking at the wake of a ship, uh, but they should be looking at the ship to determine where the economy will be going. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so, so that um, that 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 gives you. A, we we have now a little overview of the picture, uh, and 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 now. Uh, I've already mentioned the 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 Fed versus the the golden growth rate, and just to give you some n numbers on on the gold the golden growth rate. Remember, Hanky's golden growth rate is what six point three percent. So if if we look now at what the Fed was doing, uh, it's it's kind of fantastic. <laughs> they they of course weren't looking at the money supply at all. They they, they ignored it completely. Uh, but if, if we if we go to the golden growth rate, I'm just looking at my chart so I have the numbers right. Golden growth rate, 6.3%. At the peak in February of 2021, at the peak, M2 was growing at 26.9% in the United States. So it just zoomed up. And... Uh, the current rate now is minus 3.7% year over year. So in, 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 in about March of 2022, mm -hmm. th things started slowing down. So they, 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 they went up at an unprecedented rate and now they're going down at an unprecedented rate. We haven't seen this kind of contraction since 1933. So they are very, they are excessively to the upside, but also very excessively to the downside. Right. So you got it. You kind of have a whiplash going yes. on here, and, yeah. and 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 tremendous confusion in in the in the markets and 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 at the Fed because the Fed the Fed is has confused things. Let's let's move to the Fed just a little bit. Let, let me quote just a few things. We've been talking about the quantity theory of money. And by the way, formally, we, we don't have to get out necessarily out in the weeds on this, Thomas, but what what is the quantity theory of money? Well, formally, uh, I said generally it's the relationship between money and inflation or money and economic activity. 
or shall we say money and nominal GDP. Now, nominal GDP includes inflation plus yes. the real component of GDP. So mon money changes and nominal GDP changes. So here's what, here's what Chairman Powell, uh, Chairman of the Federal Reserve in the United States, had, has had to say. He, he said, one thing he said that's true, he said, uh, this is in the Wall Street Journal, we now understand better how little we understand about inflation. Well, he said that. That, that is true. The, the, the central bank, ne they never f were able to forecast anything. But he also said in testimony, changes in monetary aggregates, that's M2 would be a monetary aggregate, changes in yes. monetary aggregates have not had a consistent, reliable relationship. They have been and, and they have not been a good predictor of economic activity or inflation. Uh, he also said monetary aggregates don't play an important role in our formulation of policy, and we don't think they are generally a good way to think about policy or inflation. So he's he's dismissed everything I'm talking about. And, and, and the proof of the pudding is in the eating, as they say. They dismissed the quantity theory. They, the Fed, did not forecast inflation or, or the coming down of inflation. John Greenwood and I, using the quantity theory of money, we, we hit the bullseye. We did forecast exactly what was going to happen, and it, and it did. And, and we embraced the quantity theory of money. So, so what's going on at the Fed? What, what, why, why, do they have, why do they have this position? That's the million dollar question. Why? They, why don't they, they why why don't they use the, the theory well, if, if, if if it's so consistent? Well, they there 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 are two reasons. One is that the models they use are what's called post Keynesian models. These have been around for about thirty years. And and for example, a, a famous one actually, an important one, and it was published in 1999 in the Journal of Economic Literature, a 46-page paper. It's it has three equations in it, and and the none of the equations include a monetary aggregate. They they don't include money, and and importantly, the article it's a very important article. Uh, Clarida, uh, Richard Clarida. Gull and Gertler wrote the paper. Those were the three authors. And, and Richard Clarida was a governor of the Federal Reserve. So he, he's an important person, personality. Uh -huh. So, so that, that, that's an important article. That, that's a post-Keynesian model. Three equations, doesn't include money. Generally, these things are called Dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. They they don't include money, but that's that's the that, that those are the models that they use. Now the other factor, the second factor, that explains why the Fed doesn't use the quantity theory of money. I think it's very political. And, and that is that there are 785 economists in, in the research departments at the Federal Reserve. And out of those, the, the ratio of Democrats to Republicans, this is, these are two big political parties in America. Yes, we, we, we know, yes. So, so that ratio is 48.5 Democrats to one Republican. So, so why That's, is that important? That's important yes. because Milton Friedman is, of course, a Republican, was a Republican. He's the, the, the dean of the quantity theory of money, and, and, and he's very much the enemy of, of all Democrats. He, he was very influential in the United States in terms of economic policy. So I think politics has a lot to, to do with it. And the other thing, that has something to do with it is what, why did the Fed basically lie and come up with all these non-monetary explanations for inflation? Why did they, why did they say, you know, this is just a temporary thing, inflation 
it's supply chain. Remember the supply chain problems? Yeah, you you team, had the same thing. Uh, team, you had the same team, thing. Team with trends the story. Yeah, you, you you had the same thing in the ECB and in Europe. The supply chain. Yeah. Then 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 it was a war in Ukraine. Then it was oil prices. Then you know this, that, and the other. All kinds, but all non-monetary. All the all these things are non-monetary reasons or so so-called explanations for inflation. Well, central banks always do this. When inflation breaks out, the central banks don't want to be blamed for inflation. And 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 if if you use the quantity theory of money and you focus on what's going on in the money supply, well, who's responsible for the money supply? The central banks. <laughs> so yeah. so they, 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 they don't want to be blamed for the inflation and the inflation tax. Because the public, they hate the inflation tax. The the public, whether you're whether you're an American or a Dutch, you, you don't like inflation. And 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 so the Fed wants to always say, or the ECB, that inflation is caused by something other than money. It doesn't that doesn't have anything to do with money. So then then we get to the the, the fact. Well, what? What does the Fed actually do? What 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 are they looking at? And and they are we know they've rejected the quantity theory of money, so they're not looking at that. But they're they're looking at what they 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 say they're data dependent. And and the ECB, the European Central Bank, says the same thing. And and they look at things like that are contained in what's called the, these financial condition indices. And and these include a lot of things like interest rates on bonds, yeah. and and uh, 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 spreads on interest rates, exchange rates, unemployment rates, uh, all kinds of labor market in indicators and so forth. But but those are all effects that come down the line in the transmission yes. mechanism after the cause for everything changes, after the fuel gets changed, the money supply gets changed. Then you have all these effects coming much, much later. So they're all lagging indicators, and, and, and it means that the central banks are way behind the curve, and, and they're getting bad readings because if we, if we have a change in the money supply, well, that, that will change the financial conditions indices in one direction initially but then the financial in, in, in indicators change the other way now let me give you just one example if you, if you increase the money supply as as we as we had in the covid period mm -hmm. 2020 2021 so the the money supply goes way up goes to the what moon what happens yeah. initially it, it it looks like if you look at financial condition indices, it looks like the monetary policy is is getting easier because interest bond yields go down initially, yeah. <clears throat> and, and and interest rates go down initially. So it's but easier then, to 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 lend. Right then then after you get this big lag and inflation kicks in, what happens? Interest rates go up. So the first thing. The money supply goes up. That's that's really what's causing everything. But if you look at the financial in, in, in conditions indices, you get faked out because initially it looks like you have easy money. Ah, uh -huh. yes. And interest rates go down, but then inflation goes up and interest rates go up, and and that's what we have right now. What what do we what do we have in the United States? We have first. We had the money supply go up, then then interest rates went actually went down, and now the interest rates are going way up. The ten year bond yield, you know, it's over five percent. It went over five percent in the United States. So, so, so you get uh, e in increasing the money supply. A, a, by the way, as Milton Friedman said, to quote Friedman. Monetary policy is not about interest rates; it's about changes in the money supply, and and this is a good example. The change in the money supply initially was up, and then 
the financial conditions, the, the bond yields initially went down. Look, they look easy. But then they go up and they look like the mon uh, mon monetary policy is tight if you're looking at interest rates. So, so you get faked out. Yep. If you're if you're looking at these conditions, you're you're always off. Uh, right now, for example, we have very high interest rates in the United States, but we we don't know it, it is is that a late stage of of the increase in the money supply. It 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 it, it is, I think. But it's not the. It, but but if you're looking at financial conditions only and not the money supply, you might say it's it's the early stage of of of, of a mon monetary tightness, which we we. Because it is it, because it, that you because you mean that uh, in the late stages of the monetary expansion that the markets or the lenders are seeing higher inflation and they want a higher uh, yield because of the inflation. Is that what you, what you yes. mean with the late stage? Yeah. Yes, that's a, that's a late stage. So, so right now, the high interest rates, if you're just looking at monetary conditions and, and you try to relate it actually to the causality, what's going on, you, you, you don't know if, if, if the high interest rates you're observing now and the financial conditions in, indices are, are a late stage of, of a monetary increase, or are they an early stage of monetary decline? You, you don't know by looking at the financial conditions index. You have to look at the money supply because it's a money supply that changes everything. Yes, but but, I but it's yeah. changing it, Thomas, with, with the, these long lags. These long and by the way, they're variable lags. They they they. they the, the lags vary in length, so you, you've you've got to really it, it it's a tricky thing to be figuring it all out. And if you look at the financial conditions index, you're you're, you're just lost. You're you're getting bad signals all the time. You you really don't know what's going on because you're ignoring the fuel in the tank. What was the fuel? The money supply change. What 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 was going on with that? A year ago, a year and a half ago, two years ago. So basically, you have you have uh, when you're not looking at the money supply or the quantity theory of money, you're also looking at non-monetary arguments that don't make sense, really, yes. from what's going on. Plus, yes. you have the quantity theory of money that isn't being used by most central banks and most uh, post-Keynesian economic models. Then you have the lags. If you don't know about the lags, you will also miss the impact and when it will take place. Plus, the lags are varying in size. Correct. And and so that, and that, that and, makes uh, it really tricky. Tricky. So so basically, you can point to the direction, but it's very difficult to pinpoint the exact moment of uh, of of the effects. Exactly. Exactly. So so that's for example that that's why that's why the. You know, inflation was was very high. Greenwood and I changed our inflation forecast to say it was going to be coming down. And by the end of this year, we said, well, the range would be two to five percent. Yeah. Uh, we, we're, we're going to be in the range. We're, we're hitting it. But the range is pretty, pretty wide because it's very tricky to get, to get it exactly. The main thing, you know, is that the thrust of things is inflation coming down. Coming down. And, yes. and in Europe, by the way. It's going to come way down, way down in Europe. And, and by 2025 in the United States, if they continue with this ignoring the money supply and, and continue with quantitative tightening in the United States, in 2025, we, we could actually see deflation. Oh, wow. Not, 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 not just disinflation. We see actually deflation where the where the consumer price index is negative because so, the money supply is is being is being sh is shrinking at such a, a a a big rate that deflation will be the result of that right remember the hanky's golden growth rate to hit the inflation target of two percent in the u.s you've got to be at 6.3 percent m2 growth and we're contracting at minus 3.7 right now yeah, year, that's, year, uh, year over year. 
that sounds um and i think that we can we can move on to the markets now because that's an also an important question but okay what what is the effect of that um shrinkage of the money supply on the economy okay here uh i i think something else that's baked in the cake given the transmission mechanism is the fact that we will have a recession in 2024 we we just got the third quarter GDP numbers in the United States, they are very hot. It looks like the economy is very hot right now. But, but again, John Greenwood and I are predicting inflation will come down and by the end of next year, it'll be between one and 2%. Yes. And we, we will also sometime in 2024, we don't say exactly when, sometime in the year 2024, we will enter a recession. In the United States, so so in the markets. If you look at the markets, Greenwood and I just had a piece in the Monday Monday's Wall Street Journal, and and we argue that you you get the signs look very uh, much like they did prior to the stock market crash. Remember Black Monday on October nineteenth uh, of nineteen eighty seven. I do. That, yeah. That went, the the market crashed. It went down over twenty two percent in one day. I mean, a huge decline. And and what was going on then? The the ten year yield on on bonds was was shooting up. It had gone up from seven to ten percent. And the money supply it wasn't con it, it was it was declining. It wasn't mm. contracting like it is now. It was negative. But but the rate of growth had, had about uh, been reduced by about fifty percent. Okay. So you had you had this late stage of in interest rates going up sharply, and the mm -hmm. money supply coming down, and and you had Black Monday in October of nineteen eighty seven. Now you have rising really rising in, rising interest rates and a, a bigger contraction in the money supply is. Uh, it sounds a lot like what is happening right now. That's that's exactly what's going on. So the contraction in the 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 the, the bond yields have, have gone up dramatically on the ten year, and and the money supply contraction is is actually much sharper than it was prior to Black Monday Ooh. in nineteen eighty seven. So we we warned our readers that we're we're in danger because the stock market. Is pretty pricey now. The price earnings ratios are pretty high. They yeah. they they're they're they're, they're actually a little higher than they were in 1987. They were over 20 the PE ratios in 1987. They're they're even higher, a little higher than that right now. So so when when that ha if that happens, let, let's say that let's let's go through a scenario. Mm -hmm. And the scenario is we we really have a, a crash in the stock market. The Fed then will pivot. The Fed then 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 will start reducing interest rates. And if they start reducing interest rates, the I think the dollar will become. Uh, uh, it depends, of course, on what the ECB and other central banks do. But but my guess is that the dollar will probably get weaker. The dollar is very strong right now. Very strong. So a stock market crash like. 1987 would cause the Fed to pivot and reduce interest rates in the United States, and I think the one one result of that would would be, in fact, that the U.S. dollar would get weaker, which is a big deal because it's very very strong right now. So a, a very strong dollar is also very. Um, it it puts a lid on the inflation. Uh, the, the 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 rising prices in the inflation calculations, right? Right, it, 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 right. The the tendency the tendency is to to mitigate inflation problems. If you have yeah. a strong currency, that 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 is a mitigating factor. So if you have a weakening currency, that will only put more, well, let's well, it, put it, 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 put it, more it, fuel it, on the fire uh, of inflation. It, well, yeah, it it. it it, 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 it in, inflation will will be higher than it would otherwise be in the United States. Uh, tr 
you know, it, it, it is an open economy, but it's so huge that trade is not really that big, uh, okay. that big a right. factor. If you, if yes. you have a smaller, if you have a small open economy like Great Britain, for example, the sterling exchange rates very important for inflation. Because everything has, is being imported because it's an island. Everything's Im import, export, import, export. Yes. The, okay. the, the trade sector in the Great Britain is, is, is very large. And the, so US, have, the, US, the US is not, it's, it, it's not. In, it's big, but not in, rel in, it's, in it's relatively small. Amounts, yeah. In absolute amounts, Thomas, it's huge in the United States. But relative to the total size of the whole economy, it's, it's not very big. Yeah. I have one it's final. Not, it's not like it's not like Holland, you know. No, we are we are we are kind of like the the logistics center of Germany, basically. That's right. But I have one final question on the markets because that, that that's one 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 question that has been on my mind. Using the quantity theory of money or your own uh, like estimates, looking at the current rising of of the yields and the uh, contraction of the money supply that has not been seen since not been seen since the 1930s is there any indication on the the depth and the severity of the recession do you think it will be a a big one or is is there anything you can say about that well um yes in in uh but but cautiously and that that is uh, uh if the Fed continues to do what it's doing with quantitative tightening, meaning shrinking the balance sheet of, of the Fed and, and, and contracting the money supply. The longer that quantitative tightening endures, the deeper and longer the recession yes. will be. That, that's about all I can say about yeah, it. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Yeah. Thank the, you. The, the idea, Thomas, that, that you can accurately pinpoint exactly when the recession is going to hit and exactly how deep it's going to be, it, it's really a fool's game. You, you, can't, you can't do that. You, you can, but, but if, especially if you're trading, that, that is not so important. What's important is to get the direction of things the right way. And then ride the wave. <laughs> yeah. Right. Talking about trading. You and uh, um, uh, your your colleague Kofnes, Hank Kofnes, yes. Yeah. Uh, you have developed a gold sentiment score that is a very good tool for trading uh, gold. So not 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 on the long term, but really for trading that commodity. Is there something you can say about that? Yes. Um, first, the distinction you made between trading and investing in the long term is very important for people to get. Let, let me mention just one thing I forgot earlier before we switch into the Hanky Kaufman's goal. Okay, thing. sure, no problem. Uh, so, so you get all the central bankers explaining and trying to explain to the public that you have these non-monetary factors that are causing inflation: supply chains, the war in Ukraine, oil prices. All, all, all of this is going on. Uh, of course, that's not correct. But that's what's in the press. So, so the, your, your, your listeners, when they're reading the newspaper, that, that's all they read. The, the quantity theory of money is, is excluded. It's, it's censored. It, it's not in the press. You, you don't find this in the press at all. So the public gets the wrong picture because the press, what, is, what does the press do? The press... They repeat whatever the central banks tell them, and and why do the press why why does the financial press do that? They do it because the reporters want access to the central banks. They they want to be able to talk to insiders at the central banks, and the only way they can do that is if they repeat what they're being told at the central banks. So the the press is just a convenient conveyor of whatever the whatever the propaganda is that the central bank put out so so this is this makes it very difficult for the average person to make any sense out yeah. of out of anything going on because the average person they have a job they're they're, they're not analyze they're not involved in the quantity theory of money they're they're reading the press and they're trying to figure out what's happening by reading the press 
yeah. but the press the press is really filled with a, a lot of incorrect and irrelevant information <laughs> my my yeah. I, I have a hanky's hanky's 95 percent <laughs> oh. rule is 95 percent of what you read in the financial press is either wrong or irrelevant I was so, just wanted to uh, <laughs> I was just wanted to talk about your uh, your 95% rule yeah <laughs> so, so at any rate let's let's move to the gold trading now uh, yes this, and so Abe Kaufness and I uh, actually Abe, Abe was a I've known for many years because he he was a student of mine at the University of California at Berkeley when I was a professor there uh, in the early 70s uh, we've developed a way to measure the sentiment, bullish or bearish sentiment in the gold market. And we do that with very high frequency data. We're measuring this every hour. Now, how do we do this? We we do what's called text mining, which which means a, a computer is doing this. We're, we're not doing this. Now, the, the, the text mining is this. Every article that comes out every hour, the computer is reading the article and text mining for the key words that we have in our dictionary to determine whether the article is bullish or bearish. And that's how we measure sentiment. And, and, and we have the sentiment can go plus 10, that would be very bullish, or minus 10, that's very bearish. And that's the sentiment every hour that's in the market. So how do, how do we trade this? We, we, we've we developed algorithms that we hook up to the sentiment, and, and those those are calibrated in various ways. But the, the general idea is, let, let's say we get a, a very bullish reading, like plus five, for example. We know that with a probability of about 60%, Oh, that, 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 that bullish reading will will revert back to neutral or bearish. So you go to an extreme and it comes back. You go, you could be extreme bearish and it will come back towards bullish. So to trade, the algorithms are set up. They're, they're kind of a contrarian type yeah. trade because if things get very bullish, you, you want to either liquidate your long position in gold and or go short. And if they're very bearish, you want to do just the reverse. You, you, you want to liquidate your short position and or go long. And, and, and we've been running the, the, this for a couple of years now. These algorithms, depending on exactly the algorithm you're using, the, the returns have been about 30 to 40 percent per annum so very very high rates of return but but this is trading we we could we could be in and out of the market maybe three times in one day oh that's a lot wow that's so, high frequency. so we, we, we could be we could be long and we could be short and we could be long again so so the the interesting part of it though is that the returns num number one it's it's the only available mechanism to measure sentiment in the market that we're aware of and we're, we're started with gold is the is the only the only sentiment tool or in the gold market the only the only sentiment for anything oh wow so so we're, we're the we're, we've developed this as a unique feature cool. and and we will as as we continue and refine things we'll 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 go to other markets and do this, but we we're right now still in the shall we? I I would say the, the late stages of refining and, uh, and 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 so forth with with gold, but we yeah. will go to we'll, we will go to another market. Now what 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 this the interesting part of this Thomas? Let, let's assume that the gold market d doesn't move over the year. It, it the the price at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year exactly the same. I I don't care because it's fluctuating all the yes. time, up and down, up and down, and we're trading it up and down, up and down, up and down. So so it has this this sentiment 
has nothing to do with the long run fundamentals in the market. It's, it's short term changes in sentiment, what people are thinking about. Yeah, this, it's so kind of like the, trading on the trading on the emotions of the participants of the market. That's it's it's kind of a, it's like you said, it's a really unique tool of um, executing trades in the gold market. Yes, and and it's it's not a theory. We're actually doing it, and it works. Yeah, I mean, it's really cool. It, 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 you know, if you if you can be trading and you're you're pocketing thirty percent per year, that's pretty. That's a pretty good performance. Even if you can hook it up to a to like an algorithm and that does the work for you, it's not uh, not too shabby. <laughs> yeah. So so at any rate, that that's what we're doing, and I think with your viewers, you're you're going to be able to tell them how they can follow me on on Twitter or now as yeah. I call X. I I have. You know, six hundred and seventy-two thousand followers. I think I'm the third most influential economist in the world, according to Focus Economics in Spain, uh, which rates these things. So that they can do that. People can also just send me an email if they want to be put on my distribution list, and that's just Hanky H A N K E at J H U dot E D U, or you can go to the Gold Sentiment Report, which you've got the yes, the Gold Sentiment Report dot com. Yeah, you you've got that. So that, I will that, also I will also put interested. these uh, I will also put it below the description of this video. So all the, the you I would just hyperlink it, and then they can uh, our our viewers can just click on that, and they will get to the right uh, page. Okay, that that yeah, that will be great. So I think uh, Thomas, unless you have some final thought or question. Uh, the fuel's almost out of my tank. Yeah, <laughs> we need to put. Some, is that because of the Fed, of or because of this discussion? <laughs> well, uh, uh, well, uh, the, the, I I could keep talking to you for a long time, but I'm afraid we wouldn't have anybody listening after. The no, <laughs> I would. No, well, I have some. I have some final thoughts. Uh, I just wanted to thank you really. Uh, thank you really much for your time and your the, the sharing of your knowledge. Uh, it was for me like listening to well really like uh, attending a college and listening to a professor and and i luckily i am uh, i'm recording this otherwise i would be making notes <laughs> because it was really interesting and i would like to thank you uh, for the time and 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 all the energy and the effort and explaining this to uh, to me and our listeners because it's uh, it's a, uh, really valuable information so thank you well uh, thomas thank you very much for inviting me it's a pleasure to be with you and especially to be uh, focused in in part in, in a Dutch audience because uh, as as you know I I f I frequent Amsterdam on a regular basis. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. Maybe we can do this um, uh, as a, in in a on a recurring basis, or maybe just have another interview in a couple of months to yeah, maybe get. That, uh, that'd be wonderful. Let's do that then. And for now, I would like to uh, uh, again thank you and um, say bye to our listeners uh, and to the next interview. Thank you. Thank you.